Okay, after a brief interlude, um, I'll hand back to Jan now who will give us a talk about WebM content with GStreamer. Thanks, Jan. Hi again. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so this talk is uh, about, well, as Jonathan just said, it's about producing video in the WebM format using GStreamer based tools, uh, but more generically, it's just about producing video in GStreamer, sort of a tour of the different tools, and as a second half, it's about what is WebM and why might people use it. Uh, so, uh, quick note, I work for Oracle as my employer. They don't actually pay me to do GStreamer stuff, but they do pay me, so that supports it in a sense. Uh, so, st so to start with, what is WebM? Uh, WebM is the name for, uh, it's, a, it's a free video standard that comes from Google. Uh, specifically, it's the name of, they gave their container format, which is based on Matroska. And I'm not quite sure why they felt the need to rebrand Matroska, because it was already pretty well known as a, a file container. But nevertheless, it, it, it sort of serves as an umbrella term, uh, WebM before Matroska contained, Matroska uh, container inside which is VP8 video with Vorbis audio. And so the interesting part is the video codec. Sorry? To the exclusion of all other codecs. Right, right. To the exclusion of all other video codecs. So they don't, you can't call it WebM, if you put other codecs in it, Matroska. Right. Uh, so the video codec is the most interesting part. Uh, the VP8 codec that they acquired through On2, who were the, the company that originally released the VP3 standard that became Theora. So VP3, they've gone through a few revisions. They're up to VP8. And what Google released was their reference encoder, decoder, and a sort of half-baked spec that you can't really implement unless you look at their encoder and decoder. Um, and in fact, it's, it's to the point where, you know, they, they, they're a good demonstration of why you need independent implementations of things in order to verify that your spec is complete and that your spec is accurate. Because of course, as soon as people started to try and implement their own versions of the VP8 codec, they got to the point where they couldn't go further without referring to the source code, which is an indication that the spec is incomplete. And worse, they got to the point where they found there are bugs where the reference encoder and decoder don't match the spec, <coughs> but no one noticed because the encoder and decoder share the same code, so they both have the same bugs, so the videos come out not matching spec, but they're decoded not matching spec, so it's all fine. <laughs> Um, they're not as good as they could be, but you know Google's response was, "Oh, we'll, we'll just update the spec." But um, when really they should have fixed their encoder and decoder because the way the spec had it was better. But anyway, nevertheless, some some FFmpeg guys did their own implementation of the of a decoder, and that yielded the FFvp8 decoder, uh, which is faster than the Google reference decoder and gives us a separate independent implementation to verify encoder results <coughs> against. And then the final, the final point is that it's potentially a good choice for the web uh, as a video format for a bunch of reasons that include uh, things like it has the potential to be a decent codec um, to give us a codec on the, the par on par with baseline H.264, for example, but free. So H.264, the big drawback, of course, is that it's not a capital F free standard. You, you can't go around using it willy-nilly without starting to have to buy into patent pools. Whereas Google's claim for VP8 is that it is not patent encumbered. Uh, whether that's entirely true or not is yet to be seen. But if that is true, then it gives us a free standard of 
decent quality, uh, potentially better than Fiora as a video standard. On uh, FF58, do you know how much of the stake they actually implemented? Because the first release of FF58 was only doing a, a small subpart of, of, of the features of No, FF58 I don't. As far as no, I don't know. Sorry. I didn't know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the other reason I'd give for this potentially being a good choice for web video is that we may not really have a choice with giants like Google and Apple slugging it out uh, and deciding the, the browser format. We can have our own format for Firefox, but really we're going to have to support what the web starts producing as the video content when people start putting large quantities of video and YouTube is probably the biggest and YouTube by default is going to go with Google's decision and is already implementing WebM as a, as a, as a format. So that's, that's the introduction to WebM. The, the next bit of it is about the GStreamer support for it. Uh, so that's about getting WebM support and there's a, the, the details for a couple of distros. On Ubuntu 10.10, you need to get the, the PPA and install that. So you add that as a se separate repository, run an upgrade, and it will upgrade all your GStreamer packages to, and pull in the VP8 uh, libraries to give you WebM support, both production and, and playback. On Fedora, Fedora 14 has it. For Fedora 12 and 13, it's in the updates. Gen 2, of course, it was in Portage as soon as it was in GStreamer. They just bumped their pointers and everyone went and compiled for a few days. Uh, and it's in testing and unstable on Debian, but it's not in stable. So if you get that and you, you run upgrades on your GStreamer, what you get is a, uh, a few new components installed in your, your GStreamer plugin stack. Uh, and there, you, you'll probably already have Vorbisync because it's in the base plugins that are on every distro that runs GNOME. But you will get the WebM MUX and VP8 encoder, and you'll get the VP8 decoder. But oh, this is mostly about producing content rather than playing it. So you get the encoder and you get the specific WebM MUX container that um, restricts you to only using. WebM and Vorbis, uh, VP8 and Vorbis as the, the input codecs. And then there's a slightly, oh, it's a bit better on the screen. So there's a, a diagram of what it looks like when you encode um, WebM content with GStreamer, which some people who've already used GStreamer will know that it's a framework that relies on building these pipelines, these processing pipelines for media, and you plug together components, you, you, you put elements into the pipeline and you connect them together to describe how the data should flow and how the data flows describes the formats that they go through. So in this case we've got some raw video coming into the VP8 encoder, it's being encoded in there and then handed off to the muxer and same for the audio channel and then beyond the muxer you're writing it out to a file. So that's a file sync on the end. Uh, that's what GStreamer is doing internally and then all this bit of to the left of it is just elated because that depends on where you're getting your video from, whether you're streaming it or capturing it or decoding it from somewhere else. Yep. Why is the encoder under the bad plugins? Okay, so the, the distinction between the r different Tables, the different repositories for a GStreamer are based on a couple of criteria. So we have the GStreamer core, which is the media agnostic, doesn't doesn't know about any specific media. It's just the the scheduling and um, negotiation logic. We have the base plugins, which is a set of demonstration plugins that are of the the highest quality and have good documentation and demonstrate how to implement. Uh, the other types of media handling in GStreamer. 
And then the majority of the media handling actually live in the good, the bad, and the ugly repositories. And which one of those they live in is based on properties like uh, whether they're patent free, whether they're high quality code, uh, whether they have a maintainer, whether they have documentation. The reason the VP8 encoder is in the bad plugins is because all new plugins start there and they live there until they meet the, the quality and documentation criterion and then they either move to good or ugly based on whether they're patent encumbered or uh, licensed in a way that they can be used with, with GPL apps okay. So VP8 Inc is in the bad plugins because no one's brought it up to the level to have it move and probably because there's not yet enough evidence as to whether it should go to good or ugly for patent considerations. Uh, so these are, the, then I want to talk about some of the methods you can use for producing WebM video. So some of the, the tools that are available. Uh, the first one Jamie demonstrated in the, the last talk is Transmageddon, which has a nice simple UI and almost no configuration for you to do. You just open it, select a file that you want to transcode. You either pick a preset, which you don't want to do for WebM, you just leave that as no preset and you select WebM as the output format and it automatically switches to Vorbis and VP8 and you hit transcode and then you leave it go and you end up with a, a file after a couple of minutes. So, you know, pretty simple. Uh, second option is Arista, which is also a transcoding utility and has almost just a, a simple a UI. You choose a file, you choose your computer as the device and you choose WebM as the format and then you say add that to the encoding queue and give it a an output location and file name. Save and then it'll go and do that. So the benefit of Arista. It's also got a simple UI. You can enqueue multiple files at a time and it'll work its way through the queue. I guess it also gives you the, the live preview, which is kind of useful for seeing where it's up to in the file. And as a more general benefit over Transmageddon is uh, Arista has presets that you can download from a database on the web, so they're all built into Transmageddon, but Arista people can generate new profiles for specific devices, so you could, they could produce, for example, a specific YouTube upload uh, optimized format that converts it to specifically 480p WebM direct uh, for upload to YouTube, and as soon as they put that in the database online, you'll get offered that. Everyone's watching the video instead of listening to me, aren't you? <laughs> PTV, the third option. Uh, you already saw PTV a bit in the last talk, but we didn't specifically show you how to um, how to go WebM. But it's as simple as you might hope. When you go render project, the default container is OG. You switch it to WebM. The video switches to VP8. The audio is Vorbis and then you hit render. Um, I guess you might, keen observers might also note that this is a different render dialog than, than what Jamie demoed because I'm running PTV git and they've updated this with a bit more 
detail. favorite which isn't rendered too well there the GST launch syntax um, you can just write your own GStreamer pipeline and um, paste that into a terminal I don't know why Jamie thinks that's complex <laughs> you, just, you just you know you just GST launch you get a file you'll tell it where the file is you decode that, that name, run that through a queue, run that through VP8 Inc, run that into a WebM marks, give that a name, take the decoder, run it through a queue, run that through Vorbis Inc, and into the muxer, and put the muxer out to a file. You know, away it goes. <laughs> <laughs> the benefit of GST launch is that you get uh, immediate access to all of the 241 plugins and 1167 elements that are available in GStreamer for doing video effects, and uh, you know you can you can control the sample rate, uh, do equalizing on the audio rotate the video, all those things. So if we want... Ah, because a bang only counts in a shell if it's got a character after it. It's a bang in a space is not a... gets passed through by the shell. <laughs> so this would, mo this would break, but... So, next one, uh, the GStreamer editing services that I also mentioned. That's the, the new framework that uh, the PTV guys are working on. It's a new module in the, the GStreamer repositories that gives access to simplifying video transitions and video effects. It has a command line that starts to look a little bit more like an FFmpeg style transcode, for example, so you can just do a GStreamer editing services launch and you give it a, an input file, you say start that file at its, t its zero time, uh, so it's file name, uh, cut-in location, and then the duration of the, the clip. And in the zero for duration means play the entire file, so effectively this command line is take this input file, play the whole thing, uh, I forget what uh, dash s is. Uh, but if you uh, dash s is smart render. Okay, so that um, tells it to skip, tr don't decode, and then re-encode if you can avoid it. Do a smart so. That the idea would be if you feed this an OG file, it will avoid re-encoding the Vorbis. It will just pass that through and only transcode the video portion of it. Give it an output file. Uh, tell it you want video slash WebM as the output format for the container. V for the video codec, A for the audio codec. And I click that, it'll go and launch that and run. that'll run for you know, usual transcoding duration and then give me the output file. And the the nice thing about the GStreamer editing services that they're they're still still kinda of getting to, but they have this they have this uh, UI you can use to automatically build up that same description 
that I gave you as a command line thing. You can add, you add a file, you can set the duration, set the point where you're going to come into the file. Add another file. And you can insert um, effects and transitions in, in between there, for example. change what transition it is. But so this, this is a bit of a demo that they're working on, but the idea is you generate like this the the set of play this file, play this much of it, trans do the transition, do, the, do this effect on the video, and then you can save that out as a description. And what you end up with is a um, just a simple text file that describes that thing and because it's text you can you know you can easily edit that change the file names and then you can feed this file as input to the GES launch command to run a specific transcode this kind of text to be easy to script are those files now like the, the two files are they um, sequence or are they parallel they're in sequence. Yeah. So it's like a playlist file. Right. It's a playlist that also lets you specify transitions and, and effects. So this is, this is effectively what PTV will be doing as its underlying layer now. When you do manipulations on the timeline, it'll just be modifying this description that's being given to the, the GStreamer editing services layer. And then the final method, I'm going to run really ahead of time here. But the final method I want to talk about is the Flowmotion as a WebM production method. So Flowmotion is a, a streaming server that is produced by Fluendo in Spain and is designed for doing live streaming uh, tasks. They added WebM support in the 0.8.0 release uh, which is available. They, they produce a repository for Fedora because that's what they use for their their streaming platform that they run. There are no packages that I know of for Ubuntu 10.10 yet, but I assume that it will be as it come as an automatic upgrade in the next release of Ubuntu. In the meantime, I've gone and installed it from source, which is pretty easy once you have the, the GStreamer PPA. Flowmotion is a one package compile and it comes with this really nice UI uh, that I'll just give a really simple demo. Uh, for anyone that hasn't used Flumotion before, it has very advanced capabilities where you can enroll a whole bunch of computers, you run a Flumotion daemon on each of them and you connect them to a centralized manager machine and you can get all of those machines to do different tasks in your streaming platform so you can have uh, one machine that's doing the video capture handing it off across the network to another machine that's doing the encoding ha which hands it off to 50 machines that are the HTTP front ends for example. Uh, so it has this nice wizard and a really simple test mode that'll just run on localhost. I want to create a live stream. I'll just use the test video and test audio which are color bars, some text in, sine wave audio, and then I just choose WebM as the format. Give it, use the default encoder bitrate and audio bitrate. Give it a URL. <coughs> run finish and then it starts up all these different components which you can see are all running on my local host but could be running on other machines across the network well it does seem to be in that, the uh, is in Ubuntu but I think it's 064 rather than 080 yep. so 
So, there you go. That's live encoding a random stream and doing then. Let me turn, the, turn that off. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a simple demo stream, but for example, I could also have created that to be capturing from my web camera and, and microphone and then playing it, but that would have been just as nasty a feedback effect. <laughs> <laughs> and then all the components. Uh, so that's, that's it. Flumotion is pretty easy if you want to set it up to stream WebM format. You can stream on demand from files or capture from a webcam. And, um, deliver out onto the web pretty easily. And let's get my slides back. Okay. So that's all the methods I was going to talk about. Uh, so then just some quick examples. These are not hugely amazing because they're you know, up on the screen at low res and they've been already scaled down quite significantly. But just as a, a quick comparison, that's a single frame from a high def VP8 encode. It's the same in H.264. And this was taken from a nice exhaustive comparison that one of the main um, X.264 developers did as a technical critique of WebM, uh, as a VP8 as a video encoding format. Um, and these were some of the screenshots from the tail end of that. It's just really, it's really hard to see the difference there, but there, there it definitely is, especially in the leaves, that um, VP8 doesn't do as good a job as the H.264 encoder. And a big part of that is that their encoder has been optimized for a signal to noise ratio instead of using any kind of perceptual criteria for, for their video quality. So they do well on, on signal to noise ratio, but when you actually look at it, fine detail's been lost and they haven't, they haven't done well at concentrating on the things that are important to a person looking at the, the image. Um, and then just a couple of, a couple of videos. Uh, it's a 10 second example. It's a bit annoying now. <coughs> it's been annoying since I'm also using Totem as my presentation tool. Um, so this is the original video. There's not a lot of loss, but there's, there's a little bit of, of detail gets lost in this particular encoding, but there's also a, a bit of noise around the edges where it's been downscaled to begin with. Ah, excuse me. So that was an example of um, a megabit per second, which is quite a bit for a 352 by 240 video. The original was uncompressed Y4M. Um, this one's possibly a bit bit of a better example. This is a, a original HDV footage at 25 megabits per second. It's got a lot of nice detail in the feathers and things, a little bit in the water in the background. Uh, and this is about 25 megabit. Quite, quite high res. And the equivalent video. when it's been taken down to about 630 kilobits per second. You still get almost all the, it's, kept, it's preserved a lot of the fine detail pretty nicely. It loses some of the blocky, it, the, some of the detail in the water, but that's okay because you're not really looking at the water. So I think that one's a pretty good example at 630 kilobits of, I think it'd be a reasonable alternative to DivX, for example. all the material that I prepared. Uh, so I'll just take people's questions. 
there are any. Yep. Um, the uh, method uh, that you mentioned earlier, the fluid, the fluid. The flu motion? Yeah, right. Um, do you have any idea? I mean, probably don't. I'm just wondering if you have any idea of what it uses um, behind the scenes to manage all those jobs and all those tasks. It's using actually. twisted. Flumotion is based on twisted. Uh, it's all Python in the front end and then GStreamer for the heavy lifting of the, the video content. So. Yeah, the, the architecture of Flumotion is pretty well put together. They, they use it as the platform for Fluendo's. In, in Spain, Fluendo run uh, streaming services for TV stations and things, and they yep. And so they use that. Uh, I think they they peaked at 50 gigabits a second or something with <laughs> as they're streaming with last year. Any other questions? Nice. Thank you very much for listening. I'll get an early mark. <laughs> <laughs>